The Bow is one of Alberta's iconic rivers. It's been seen and photographed by untold numbers of tourists. It's been rafted on, canoed on, fished in. It's a lifeline, not just for people, but for the plants and animals around it. It gets its start from melting glaciers, including the Bow Glacier itself. But that meltwater is soon overwhelmed by runoff from melting snow. Runoff something like 80% of the river's volume. Add groundwater, and that original glacial melt is now just 3% of the total. But some total. At its peak in late spring, the bow could fill an Olympic swimming pool in three or four seconds. And it's more than just water for drinking, boating, or swimming. The bow is its own natural habitat, a place for life of all kinds. First Nations people have lived along the bow for centuries. It's actually named for the reeds they use to make bows. Grizzlies love the buffalo berries that grow on the banks. And in fall, mountain whitefish swim from the bow up to Lake Louise under cover of darkness. But the river itself is inconsistent. It surges and recedes with the seasons. The area around the river is actually as prone to drought as it is to flooding. But in Alberta, 2013 will always be known as the year of the flood. It began June 20th with a catastrophic combination. Huge rain clouds hovered over the mountains, dumping enormous amounts of rain, about half the average annual total for the area in just two days. But the center of it all was the Bow River and its tributaries. The total flood area was enormous. That warm rain washed away the remaining snowpack, and as the water rushed downhill, water tables, already high, absorbed very little. In many places, like Cougar Creek and Canmore, the landscape was transformed. The town of High River was devastated. In the end, the cost of the flood was probably $8 billion. Even so, flooding would be much more common if it weren't for the surrounding landscape, like alpine meadows, forests, and fenlands. Those are wetlands especially prominent here near the Ghost River. The Ghost, by the way, contributes 10% of the water in the bow. It never freezes. Around here, forests and fens act as giant sponges, holding back runoff, even removing polluting chemicals before releasing the water. But the tracks left by all-terrain vehicles degrade fens, so runoff increases, wetlands drain, aquifers aren't renewed. And this is the issue. Albertans love the bow, always have. Scenery, wildlife, rafting, fishing, it's one of the main reasons people come to live and play here, and it kicks tens of millions into the economy. But all the things we do affect the bow one way or the other. So for instance, it is the most actively managed river in Alberta. These are the upper and lower Kananaskis lakes. They're natural lakes, but their levels are maintained by dams. Those dams generate power. And the dams here are three of the total of 13 on the bow, all built over the last 100 years but they have minimal impact on the river's flow. On the other hand, the growing population living along the bow, especially in Calgary, needs wood for building homes. Where there's active logging along the river valley, there's the risk of disrupting river flow. Forests hold back the snowpack at higher altitudes, slow the overland flow of water, and stabilize slopes. The trick is to harvest while maintaining as much of the integrity of the forest as possible. This is the Sheep River Basin near Black Diamond. It's also a hydraulically connected area, a network of streams, sloughs, and springs that hold and filter water, a hedge against both sudden storms and droughts. This landscape is dotted with oil and gas wells and their access roads. Energy infrastructure inevitably degrades a system like this. Again, the challenge is to minimize that impact. The effect of farming is not so much that it disturbs the flow of the bow, it both takes up water and replaces it, but farming can degrade water quality by supplying excess nutrients. Nitrogen and phosphorus from manure trigger overgrowth of algae, leading to dead zones in the river. Strategically placed artificial wetlands could sequester algae and prevent that damage. Even municipal wastewater plants can be overwhelmed by high water flow and release waste, even pharmaceuticals, into the river. We all have to accept that there are trade-offs. 
Each of these activities, even the simple act of building a road, affects the river valley. Floods can destroy picnic areas. Algae can ruin fish spawning habitat. It's time we examined all the activities we're committed to, not to eliminate them, but to decide how best to minimize their impact. We all use the river. We should all protect it.